Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this beautiful summer day. We give you thanks for the freedom to worship, to praise your name, to proclaim your word, to encourage one another as we walk by faith. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of each of our hearts, be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Today we begin a four-week series on the creeds, and the word creed comes from the Latin word credo, which means I believe. We will use scriptures that provide testimony from the people of God to how God comes to us and how we understand God as Father, God as Son, and God as Holy Spirit. The creeds are far more than words that are just flat on a page. They have great power. The final week, we will center on what does it mean to be a creedal people? What does it mean to live when you say, I believe in God the Father? It is where we will end, but it is also where I would like to begin. This week, I've been doing some reading and wanting to remind myself about the faith traditions, in essence, the proclamation, I believe, how that shaped our ancestors who began our nation in its earliest years. Our earliest settlers came in the 17th century crossing the Atlantic Ocean to practice their faith freely to escape religious persecution in Europe. You could say they were looking for freedom of religion. Others, however, who came to our shores would describe that they were looking for freedom from religion, escaping this close association of government and religion being intertwined, especially taxes imposed to the church. And still others would say they were coming for economic freedom, which often was lacking in Europe and other countries due to inheritance laws, monarchies, and the like. We hear names like the Puritans of New England, the Quakers of Pennsylvania, the Catholics of Maryland. They came and wanted to establish a plantation of religion, as I was reading in one article, turning to the colonies, turning the colonies into a city on a hill, a holy experiment, whose success would prove to their European enemies that God's plan for his churches could be successfully recognized and realized in the American wilderness. Even colonies like Virginia, which were planned as commercial ventures, were led by those who considered themselves militant Protestants, who worked diligently to promote the prosperity of the church in this country. Then new waves in the 18th century brought immigrants who brought their own religious fervor across the Atlantic, and we had our first major religious revival or awakening. And it really injected a new vigor of faith and religion into the American people. But also, at the same time, came deism. Deism made its appearance in the, in the colonies around the 18th century, and deism rejected the traditional Christian view of Christ, viewing Jesus not as a savior, but as a sublime teacher of morality. They questioned the divinity of Christ, but looked to him as a good man who we should follow his good deeds. Deism found roots in upper, uh, you know, well-to-do uh, people from the colonies, and they included some of our founding fathers. Yeah, they went to church, but deist thought really influenced their thinking. Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, and Ben Franklin. Freedom of religion and economic freedom motivated, however, the colonies to rebel against the monarchy of England. On July 2nd, the Continental Congress in, 19, in 1776 voted for independence, and it was adopted on July 4th, 
1776. It announced that the 13 American colonies then at war with Great Britain regarded themselves as 13 newly independent sovereign states, no longer a part of the British Empire. One of the most powerful and best remembered lines in the Declaration is, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These words have such power because they are more than flat words on a page. Later, those 13 independent colonies, those sovereign states, became the United States when they accepted the Constitution, which was ratified on June 21st, 1788. The Constitution, our Constitution, is the supreme law of the land. It begins, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. These words and the words that follow in the Constitution have such power because they are more than flat words on a page. But it was 87 years later that the words of the Declaration stating that all men are created equal was challenged in the Emancipation Proclamation. President Lincoln wrote on the 22nd day of September in the year of our Lord, 1,862, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States and shall be thenceforth forever free. And the executing government of the United States, including the military and naval authority, will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons. These words have such power because they were so much more than flat words on a page. But 11 months later, after the death of 51,000 people, men, who died on the fields of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, President Lincoln wrote these words on November 19th, 1863, what has been known as the Gettysburg Address. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. He goes on to say, now we are engaged in a great civil war testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can endure. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. And it is for us, the living, rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus so far nobly advanced. It is rather for us here, dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we, in, we take increased devotion for the cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. We highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain that this nation shall have a new birth of freedom and the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. These words, they have such power, don't they? Because they are more than words flat on a page. But it still took time for that all men are created equal to become a reality. 
One of the most amazing things about our U.S. Constitution is that it allowed room for new words to be added. We call them amendments. And I can't help but think that the faith of ordinary Americans helped inform these changes with those famous words of the Declaration, all men are created equal because they still hadn't been achieved, and words have power. So we have the 13th Amendment that abolished slavery. We have the 15th Amendment that prohibited federal and state governments from denying citizens the right to vote based on race, color, or previous condition of servitude. And then we had the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which gave women the right to vote in 1920. These words have such power because they are more than flat words on a page. But even then, the goal hadn't been reached that all men are created equal. For on August 28, 1963, Martin Luther King Jr. stood on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. And he said, I say to you today, my friends, so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I have a dream. A dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. This is our hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. This will be the day when all God's children will be able to sing with new meaning, my country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. These words have such power because they are more than flat words on a page. You and I, we've had an amazing history, a history of freedom of religion and freedom from religion. And it has helped to shape our nation. But we are not done yet. And how, as Christians, does our confession of I believe continue to shape us, not only as children of God, but citizens of these United States. The first article of the creed, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You will be thankful that I won't preach on the 10 sermons I could think of in that line alone, but suffice it to say that we are called to be co-creators with God in caring, preserving, our creation for the generations to come. And one author said, we don't get a full enough view of God. If you just look at God from nature, what do you think of God amidst the earthquakes and amidst the floods and the fires? Rather, we need to look at God through the second and third article of the creed as well, as God comes to us as Jesus and the Holy Spirit. The scriptures remind us that the testimony that God has done in Jesus and in the Spirit, in John 1, we hear it all there. In the beginning was the Word, the Word being Jesus. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. A creed that begins, I believe, in the Gospel of John. As ELCA Lutherans, 
We use the words of the creeds regularly in our worship. And they have such power because they are more than just flat words on a page. The Apostles' Creed we use most every Sunday, the Nicene on festivals, and the Athanasian Creed, well, I need a whole nother two weeks to preach on that one, but I will talk about it in week three. The creeds are the gospel in a nutshell, said my one Sunday school teacher many years ago. It kind of summarizes the gospel for us, the Bible, And then they are like hymns of praise to God, creator of heaven and earth, and they have stood the test of time. Isn't it amazing to think that the words that we confess each week have been sent by the people of God for over 1,500 years, some 1,800 years? They were written to challenge a thinking of Gnostic thought that Jesus really wasn't human and that he suffered and he died, but he really wasn't God either. These creeds were to put in a firm foundation of who we are as God's people and who God is to us and for us. These creeds are our foundation as the people of God. They're part of our constitution of the ELCA, part of our local Holy Cross Constitution. They're part of what I commit to uphold when I was ordained and every pastor is ordained. They are words with power, but they are much more than just words in a document. They are words that inform our living of how we walk by faith. I Believe, says the Apostles' Creed. How does that inform how we live today? How we live as citizens of these United States and how we live as children of God. For we are a blessed, a blessed people to have such documents that guide and direct us. And we are blessed because they just didn't stay that way once but they continue to evolve as we put on new lenses of how the gospel and how our life takes shape today and tomorrow. Because, my friends, when you say, I believe, your work is never done. Amen.